This is part one of two, but they're not directly related. It's just that in the second talk, I'll be focusing on Makito, mock stubs and spies, and that kind of assumes that you're comfortable with JUnit, so we're not really going to focus on the JUnit parts. For this particular talk, I have a GitHub repository. I'll share the link with you in a moment. And it has one Makito and example in it, just in case you can't make it to the second talk. You know, But feel free to ask questions about either or whatever. Heck, you can ask about Spring Boot 3. That way you don't have to go to Josh's talk. You know, So it's all good. You know? So um, thank you very much for coming. This is my contact information. I'm not sure how well this is projecting. These are the books that I've written in the past. The most recent one is actually called Makito Made Clear. It's from Pragmatic Programmers. Again, that'll be mostly the focus of the next talk. The part that you might care about, uh, actually it's on the next slide here. This is a collection of all the links that I'm going to be using just in one spot. Now the ones up here, almost all of these are off of the JUnit homepage. So it's not going to be a problem, except for this Gitter one, G-I-T-T-E-R. Did anybody ever use Gitter before? It's like a, an online browser-based Slack, if you will. And the JUnit team themselves answers questions there. They spend a lot of time there. You could always use Stack Overflow, but this is a, an alternative place you could try to see it. And the important part is this link down at the bottom at github.com slash my last name, K-O-U-S-E-N, slash JUnit5 underscore workshop. That's where all the code is. And if we add any code during this session, I'll just push the code to the repository. And that's, that's the one link you probably want to care about uh, going forward. If you forget any of that, again, back here you have my email address, ken.cousin at cousinit.com. Just send me a message, I'll get back to you. Uh, and I'll deliver the slides to whatever mechanism they decide to share out the slides, you know, for the conference. I do have my Twitter handle there for as long as Twitter survives. <laughs> Uh, don't go, which I don't know, it could be tomorrow for all we know. Uh, I also have my Mastodon link up there. I, I publish a free weekly newsletter every Sunday called Tales from the Jar Side that's hosted on Substack. And I have a companion YouTube channel also called Tales from the Jar Side for that. Sorry about the weak jokes or whatever, but that's going to happen. Um, okay, now, by the way, let me show you. Uh, here is that GitHub repository again for those who couldn't see it. It's under the accounts under my name and it's called JUnit 5 Workshop and that's what I'll be working with. But this happened like, uh, let's see, two hours ago. This is the JUnit team Twitter channel and their pinned tweet is about JUnit 5.9 being released, but you'll notice here, two hours ago, they upgraded JUnit to 5.9.3. So you, now you know what I've been doing the last hour. You know, uh, I upgraded my repositories to that. And of course, I only did the ones that I'm showing you today. Half of my repositories use JUnit, so Dependabot's gonna be harassing me for the next few days, I think. So just to let you know, yes, indeed, they did, in fact, update it. Now, I will tell you, that update is about as minor a point change as I've ever seen. There's basically nothing we have to worry about. Should I smile for the camera? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Shouldn't do that? Shouldn't smile for the camera? All right, at any rate, this slide lets you know. Now, there's only really one confusing part of JUnit 5, in my opinion, and it's the name. It's where they started it. Starting with JUnit 5, they decided to break the thing into the JUnit platform, and then this thing they call JUnit Jupiter, and then JUnit Vintage. Now the Vintage part, that's easy. That's the engine that runs JUnit 4 tests, and even JUnit 3 tests, if you have any of those. You just add the Vintage engine to your build, and you could run all your existing JUnit 4 and JUnit 3 tests with no problem. So most people upgrade incrementally. They add the Vintage engine as well as the regular JUnit dependency, and then all new tests they do in JUnit 5, perhaps, or they go through an upgrade phase whatever is comfortable for you. It's very common to have both engines involved. The confusing part is the distinction between the so-called platform and Jupyter. They say platform is the foundation and Jupyter is the programming and extension model. 
I don't really know what that means. I don't know where the boundaries are. All I know is, is that when they release a new version, I have two sets of documentation, two sets of release notes to, to take a look through. But that's the only confusing part out of all this. I am really impressed with the job that the JUnit team did in this upgrade. I think they've done a wonderful job. Now, the term Jupiter gives me an excuse to put up a picture of Jupiter from the Juno satellite. The reason JUnit 5 is called Jupiter, there's two very silly reasons. One is that the, the planet named Jupiter starts with JU just like JUnit, and the other is that Jupiter is the fifth planet from the sun, so JUnit 5. That's it, they're just being clever. I don't know if they'll go to Saturn on JUnit 6 or something like that, I have no idea. But again, any excuse to use one of those satellite photos, that's a good one. All right, now the setup is, uh, there are samples, and I'll show you where the samples are in case you want to see the current samples for the setup. They generally emphasize Gradle or Maven. There is a standalone console launcher, but I don't think I've ever used it for anything serious. I either run uh, JUnit from Gradle or Maven or inside my IDE, you know, which is fine. There is, believe it or not, still support for Ant <laughs> if you want to go that way. I think there's Basel support as well. Um, but there's one little trick you need to know that uh, only applies to the, uh, actually no, this applies to both Gradle and Maven. They switched over it from Gradle, uh, pardon me, from JUnit 5.3.1 and then they switched to 5.4.0. Starting at, at 5.3.1 was the last version where they actually split the API from the engine. The API is, of course, what you code to. The engine is what runs the test. That's why the API is under test implementation and the engine's under test runtime only. But apparently that message was having trouble getting through. So starting in 5.4.0, they put in what they call an aggregate, just JUnit-Jupyter, that you put a test implementation time, and that's worked ever since. So if you make a new project in IntelliJ, for example, it usually gives you both the API and the engine because they haven't updated the wizard. But all you need is this one dependency. And as, I see, as you saw, we're up to 5.9.3 now. Um, again, it requires Gradle 4.6 or above, but Gradle's up to 8 now. So it's like, that's a while ago. And there's one other thing you have to do in a Gradle build file. You have to put in a, a test. And in fact, here it looks like this. Let me go. This is my GitHub repository. Uh, here is the top level build.gradle file. Uh, how's that font size? Can you see that in the back? That's OK. Good enough? Okay, so I've got the Java plug in there. Now, I'm also using what they call in Gradle the version catalog mechanism. So all the actual version numbers are inside this libs.versions.toml file in the Gradle folder. It's just something Gradle does to centralize all the version numbers. And you see I upgraded JUnit to 5.9.3 again an hour ago. And if I look in the build file, you'll notice there's this extra block down here called task.name uh, test that uses this method called use JUnit platform. That method has to be invoked inside this test task in order for Gradle to recognize JUnit 5 tests. Again, this is routine. When you make a build using the wizard, you'll see it. But you do have to remember to add that. If you run your build and it says no test found, that meant you forgot to add that block. That's all. It's not a crisis. It just doesn't see any tests. So that takes care of it. This I'm going to talk about later. But as long as I'm showing it to you, that property called max parallel forks is a property of the test task. And uh, that's not visible. What it does is it sets the max number of test processes to start in parallel. So you could speed up your tests, assuming your tests are independent of each other, which hopefully they are, then you could just set that to a number bigger than one, and Gradle will spawn multiple forked processes and run them in, uh, concurrently. So I generally use an a, a expression like this, what, how many available processes do I have, divide by two and add one, and whatever that comes out to be, that's how many tests I run in parallel. 
So very easy to do, has nothing fundamentally to do with JUnit, it's a Gradle capability. JUnit also has experimental support for parallelism, but we're not gonna need to worry about that because we've got this and that's good enough. Maven also has that property somehow, but I'm not sure how the Maven part works. Okay, so uh, I was mentioning Oh, uh, again, here's that vintage engine as well. So at runtime only, you could add in the vintage engine. Notice that the group ID is a little different as well. Org.junit.vintage. Uh, somebody could grab the door there if you don't mind. Thank you. Then uh, the only reason I added JUnit at the compile only stage is if you're coding to JUnit 5 tests, you need that in the compile class path. You know, JUnit 4 tests, but it's actually a transitive dependency of the engine. So if I made that test implementation, you know what I mean? Then it would be available throughout the project. So any number of ways, but I generally add these dependencies if I have any older tests inside my build. Now, there's actually a link here to the JUnit Jupyter Starter Guide, but if I go to JUnit.org, there's the website for JUnit.org, and you'll notice there is a link here called Code and Issues, and that is, in fact, the GitHub repository for JUnit 5. Now, if I, I could look at this, but I don't care about the implementation right now. If I go to JUnit Team, then they also have a sub-project called JUnit 5 Samples that's pinned up here, and this is the one that has, uh, again, I magnified a bit, so it's a little hard to see, but they have starter code for Basel and Ant and Gradle with the Groovy DSL or the Kotlin one or Maven. Like, here's the Maven one, and it'll show you the POM and everything. Uh, let's now let's magnify that again. And the dependencies, again, are all the same. You could see, oh, I get, apparently I grabbed the Kotlin one, but you see there's a JUnit 5 test. Oh, that's the, yeah, all right, I didn't mean to grab that one. Let's see, which one is? Starter Maven by itself, that's what I wanted to see. And then bring up the POM. And now I can magnify again. And what you'll see is they have a bomb now, bill of materials for, uh, for JUnit. And there's the current version, so they really updated everything. And once again, you see the API and regular uh, JUnit, that's the older one. There's the engine, there's the vintage engine, there's the Surefire plugin. I didn't happen to use Maven in my project, but again, you could just go to that site and see what the dependencies are and add them yourself. Yeah, that's right. They only added the vintage one because they thought people might want to see it. And the Surefire plugin for Maven works with JUnit. That's all. Everything else is just the one we mentioned. Very straightforward. Okay. I'm sorry, I can't hear you? If I want to run in parallel, um, it's the same. Actually, I don't know how Maven supports that. I only know the Gradle approach to run the tests in parallel there. Now, JUnit has its own parallel mechanism, and I could show you that in the docs. But I'm using the Gradle one that comes with Gradle. I'm not sure what the parallel one is for Maven, if they even have one. I don't even know if they have it. Okay. All right. First, the easy part. The stuff that everybody probably, I mean, I assume pretty much everybody's used JUnit before, right? Has anybody never used JUnit before? Yeah, okay, that's what I figured. The test annotation is still there, but they moved it into a different package. So everything that has a package with the word Jupyter in it is from JUnit 5. And this is how you can have test annotations from both JUnit 4 and JUnit 5. Some of these you'll see they, they repeated the annotations. Some they changed the names, as we'll see. So the annotation no longer has uh, any attributes in it. If you did exception testing in JUnit 4, saying something like expected equals with an exception type, there's a different way to handle that now. In JUnit 5, there is no ex expected property. Instead, there's an assert throws method, which we'll see shortly. Okay. Oh, uh, neither the test methods or the test classes have to be public anymore. 
I tend to make mine public anyway, but if you just use a wizard like an IntelliJ or whatever and say just generate a test, it'll generally make it package private just because it no longer needs to be public. They can't be private though. So at any rate, for what it's worth. Now, there are a couple of new annotations still associated with tests. Repeated tests, we're not really going to have time to go over, but I honestly don't see a lot of value in them. It's the ability to repeat the same test multiple times, but it's with the same data. So I'm not sure what's different unless you have something random inside the test. I mean, which could happen, but not often. Parameterized tests, that one's the good one. Because with parameterized tests, then you could run the same test with different data. And you could like say, let me grab a bunch of table rows and I'll run this test for every row in that set. Or a collection somewhere or use a method. That's the big thing we're going to finish on. We're going to look at the parameterized test. Starting in JUnit 5.7, that became uh, final. You know, committed, whatever. It wasn't experimental anymore. And I've been using that for a couple of years now. It's really, really nice. It's an excellent feature. Now, the test factory annotation has to do with what they call dynamic tests. You write a test that generates tests. Now, that's interesting, but their use cases are not terribly motivating. And when I want to do something that generates tests, I like jQuick better. If you've ever used that library, I'm talking about that tomorrow. In, as a different way to handle property-based testing. I like that much better. So test factory here is still considered experimental. I mention it in case you run into it, but we're not going to dwell on that. Instead, we'll use the parameterized test and the rest of the stuff here. Now, they changed the lifecycle annotations. In JNU4, you had a before and after that ran before and after each test, and a before class and after class that ran once before everything. Now the before and after are called before each and after each, which is pretty intuitive. And the before class is now before all and after all. And they will run before and after, before all run once before any tests are run. And after all will run once after they're all finished. The interesting thing now is that any method annotated with these needs to be static. Now, it makes sense on the before all. They're running before they even instantiate the class. After all, I don't really see why they had to make it static, but they did, and that's normal. Now, let me show you one interesting feature about this. So in here, I have a class called Lifecycle Tests. Let me close that. And you can see here, I want to talk to you about this guy, the test instance with the lifecycle per method. Now, to show you what's going on, I put in a constructor. Now, normally you don't put a constructor in a JUnit test, but I just wanted to see when it was invoked. And then here's a before all method. Again, the name of the method doesn't matter. There's a before each. There's one, two, three tests, and an after each and an after all. Okay? So let me run this. And that lifecycle per method is the default. So you see that the before all method runs even before the class is instantiated. So making that method static makes sense. If you forget the word static, you'll get a warning saying it's just a method with a funny name. It's not going to get run, OK? But notice also, and this is normal behavior even for JUnit 4, the class is instantiated before each test. So instantiated before, test, after. Instantiated before, test, after. Same thing, and then the after all the way at the end. But now here's a new capability in JUnit 5. This test instance lifecycle now has two options. Instead of per method, which is the default, we can use per class. And the difference now is the constructor is invoked first and only once so that the, you only have one instance of the test class itself. So if you have any attributes in this class, you're going to have to check and see whether they need to be reset each time. With the per method, they're changed. They're obviously reinstantiated every time. Uh, and also, by the way, when you use per class, you no longer have to make the before all and after all methods static anymore, because there's only one instance. If you use the Spring Framework, OK, and the test class is a singleton, like every other managed bean in Spring, then they often recommend using per class, because why re-instantiate the bean anyway? You know, it's already 
uh, going to be a singleton uh, inside that behavior. Let me just change that back. So that is a, an interesting new behavior, part of JUnit 5. A lot of people ask that, uh, ask for that capability. Okay. There's a disabled annotation now that replaces the old ignored one, and you could put in parentheses a reason why it's disabled. I got to say that the reason only shows up in a couple places. It doesn't come up on all the test reports, you know, but it's good for documentation rather than commenting out a test. You could just disable it for a given reason. Now, they added a display name annotation, and they used some rather amusing examples in the documentation. So it supports general Unicode. So they have these silly examples I took from the user manual. One's the guy flipping the table. The other is an emoji with the munch scream in it, you know. And that's just illustrating that it supports general Unicode. What I generally use that for is putting in a sentence so that you don't have to do camel case that gets very unreadable after a while. So test with display name containing special characters. Yeah, you don't have to do that. You can name the test anything you want, but the name here is what shows up on the test report, which can be useful. Now display name can also go on the class. I don't find that as helpful, because if I'm looking at a great old test report output, I'd need to know the actual class. <laughs> where the problem occurred. And if I made up some name like a sample test class, that's not going to help me. But making the names more readable, that's definitely a good thing for the individual methods inside there. OK, now the assertions have moved again. So we're used to having the assertions in, in JDA 4 in a class called assert. Now there's a class called assertions, again, in a Jupyter package. And most of the ones that we're used to are still there. They didn't change them, they just moved them there. So assert true and false, all the assert equals overloads, null and not null, same and not same to check reference equality, and of course fail. But they have made a couple of very interesting changes that took advantage of functional interfaces from Java 8 and above. And that's what I want to show you, as well as a couple of the new asserts as well. So the one that I use, I find myself using all the time, and I'll, I'll illustrate this, is assert all. One of the challenges in JUnit is that if you have multiple assertions in a test and one of them fails, then the rest don't even get executed. The ones that come after it don't execute because the test class or the test already failed. So they don't even check the rest. With assert all, you guarantee that every assertion you put in the block will run whether one or more or all of them fail or not. And I find myself using that a lot. But we have to see a little bit more about that. Assert throws is the replacement for the expected. The argument there was is if you said, oh, I'm expecting expected is a null pointer exception, the problem with that is Anything in your test could throw a null pointer exception, not necessarily calling the method you're trying to test. You know, you could just be getting access to a service and wind up with a null pointer exception, and then you'd think the test passed when, in fact, it didn't even run. With assert throws, you put the actual assertion as an argument, and therefore you know where the thing went wrong. Assert does not throw is basically documentation. It's basically saying you might have expected an exception, but none happened. And then these two are cool, assert timeout and assert timeout preemptively. I'll show you that in a moment. Now here's the differences between JUnit 4 assertions and JUnit 5 assertions. First of all, the order of the parameters are the same as before. You put in the expected answer, and then you invoke the test, whatever you're trying to do. But now, if you're going to provide your own error message, that comes last rather than first. It's not a huge deal, but it is an issue. But here's where things get different. There's an overloaded supplier argument for the last value instead of just a string. Now let me show you what I mean by this. Here's the home page again. I'm going to go to the Java docs here, or rather I'll open it in another tab. And inside here, I'm going to go to assertions. So here's assertions. And now let me magnify this so you can see it. And let me say I'll jump down to assert true or something. 
Okay, so there's a long way to go to get to that. Just a minute. There's a lot of overloads here. But you see how there's an assert true that takes a Boolean, and there's an assert true that takes a Boolean and a string. Okay, no, no problem, except that you may not be expecting the string to be last. But notice there's an assert true with a Boolean and a string supplier. And what that does is kind of interesting. It only gets the error message if the test fails. It's lazily loading the error message. And I think I have an example of this. Uh, actually, I have it in my class called Assertions Demo. So let me, let me walk through this, and I'll show you what I mean by this. So the standard assertions are exactly what you're expecting. And by the way, this is IntelliJ doing name, parameter name hints. That, that's not in the code, OK? So there's a couple of them with, an, with a message at the end. But let me show you this one. I have this special method here called getErrorMessage. It just prints that, yeah, we're inside that method, and then returns a string, OK? So here, I say, here's what I'm expecting. Here's the actual test. That should pass. And yet, you'll see with this actual test, I went inside the get error message method anyway. I formed the error message even though I didn't need it. However. Here, notice all I've done is put parentheses arrow to the left of the get error message method. That turns it into a string supplier instead of a regular string. And now when I run it, you'll see that because the test passes, we never go get the error message. Now, in general, most people provide error messages as just string constant, so it doesn't make any difference. But if for some reason your error message was complicated, if you're going to concatenate a bunch of stuff together and read some data out of a file or a database or go over a network, then you don't want to do any of that unless you need to. And that's what the supplier version is for. And you make the whole thing lazy just by putting parentheses arrow to the left, and now you're using the supplier version. In fact, the way this works is if I go inside this method, here I am inside the assertions.java class, and you see it turns around and it calls the same method on assert equals. And then here in assert equals, this is where the quote magic is happening. If the objects are not equal, then we call fail not equal with the supplier. Then they go call get on the supplier later. But if these are equal, we don't need to, and therefore we don't actually call the method we don't need. So that's very useful. That's the sort of whoop, clever thing that, that they've added. Uh, let me stick with that for a moment. Now, uh, of course, if you write things as an arrow here, that they say you know, method reference works just as well as the lambda expression, which is fine. Um, let's see. Here is an example of an assert all. Now, the interesting fact is the argument to assert all, let me show it to you in the docs. It's easier to read there. So let me go back up to the top of this. And I'm going to skip the one with the string headings. Assert all either takes a collection of executable or a stream of executable, or a var arg list of executable. Just a bunch of executable separated by commas. So then the question becomes, OK, what's an executable? An executable is their own functional interface that looks just like runnable, because it takes no arguments and returns void, but is declared to throw throwable. See, and it, it's hard throwing exceptions from lambdas, right? The, the method that you're matching has to have the exception declared in the signature already. What this means is they added their own so that if the exception, pardon me, if the test throws an exception, it's JUnit's responsibility to catch it. And then they'll report on what happened. And that executable is used all over the place. So this assert all of the executables here. You see what you do is if you have a whole series of assertions to do, you just put parentheses arrow to the left, and it's the same. It's just like it was on the supplier, except this is expecting executables, and that's um, 
no arguments and returns void and might possibly throw an exception. The beautiful thing is, however, is that this guarantees that all of those tests will run even if one or more of them fails. So the, the use case for this is I have this, you know, find a book by its ISPN number. So imagine that's some RESTful web service somewhere that is returning a book instance, and I want to check all of its properties. I don't want to write four different calls just so I could test each property one by one. This way I could test them all. Now this is the, the uh, similar to the demo they do in the docs, they actually say, you know, you can nest both short-circuiting behavior and non-short-circuiting behavior. So for example, I get this book, and a book is just a POJO that has, um, well, you can actually see it, an ISBN, a title, an author, and a, a, a date published. Okay, that's all it is. In fact, if I knew I was on Java 17, it would be a record. Okay, so down here, I do an assert all, and that guarantees that this one Oops, too many, too big. This one here, uh, that lambda, I can't seem to select it. The ISBN check will run, and the, the author check will run, and this block lambda will also run. So all three of those are guaranteed to run. But inside the block lambda, I'm going to do some extra checking about the title. So I get the title and assert that it's not null. If it's null, that short circuits that particular executable. So that executable failed, but the other two will still run. If it passes, then I get the title and I say it should have three words in the title. And again, that short circuits if it fails. And if it passes, then I can do some manufactured assertion on all three words in the title. See what I mean? You can nest them however deeply you want with it, whatever combination of short circuiting and non short circuiting behavior you need. Okay? Now, the exception testing is this there's an assert throws. Sorry, that's getting awfully small. Let me make that bigger. How about that? Can you see that better? Okay. So with the cert throws, then you put in the class that's the expected exception type you want, and again, you put in an executable. And this time, the test only passes if the executable throws that exception. Well, here I can use cert throws with the parent. You know, with, okay, this is just an exception, even though I know it's a more specific type. And it's normal polymorphism, you know, it'll, it'll catch that. There's also a related method in JUnit called assert throws exactly, where you say exactly which exception class is going to happen. So that one doesn't catch the, the children or anything like that. I'm saying I, I mean exactly that one. And I just wanted to show that both of those work just fine. So there's your exception testing. Uh, that's the method reference. Yeah, we don't need that. Now here, by the way, is a... Um, Ah, I wanted to show an assert does not throw. I mean, it's very rare, right? I mean, you expect this exception and it doesn't happen. But I thought of one case. If you ever do divide by zero with integers inside Java, it follows the IEEE 734, IEEE 734 spec. In other words, you get an arithmetic exception if you divide by zero here. And there it is. But on the other hand, if you do floating point division and you divide by 0.0, .0 you actually get infinity. <laughs> you don't get an exception. So I put in assert does not throw when you do the division because you might have expected an exception to happen and it doesn't. This surprises a lot of people and, and Java developers who are not working with floating point very often. So I found an excuse to use an assert does not throw. Now, these are the cool ones with the timeout. I thought I'd use this more than I actually do, but it's still a neat capability. Now, assert timeout takes a duration, how long am I willing to wait, and an executable. And with assert timeout, it says the executable will be exec executed in the same thread as the test. So this is going to run until completion. 
even though it's failed. It's already passed the duration. But notice also, by the way, uh, well, I'll show it to you. It returns the, the result anyway. So here we'll see a cert timeout. I'm going to wait 100 milliseconds, but I'm going to just print hello. And I'd really be in trouble if I can't print hello in less than 100 milliseconds. So that worked fine. But here I'm going to do a cert timeout of waiting 100 milliseconds, and I'm going to sleep for 200 milliseconds. Likewise, down here, I'm going to do the same thing, but with a cert timeout preemptively. And the difference is a cert timeout preemptively is executed in a different thread. And therefore, once we pass the timeout period, that one's canceled. So the way this works, and you see I've got this both of them disabled so I could check all the tests ahead of time. Here's the timeout exceeded. So it runs and we get execution exceeded timeout of 100 by roughly 100 milliseconds. You know, it told me how long it took to fail. Whereas, let's put that one back. On this one, when I do the preemptive one, it just says, yeah, you passed 100 milliseconds, we're done. Okay? So I do, where this comes up for me many times is I access a lot of publicly available RESTful web services. I do see you. And most of those services are either up or they're not. You know, they either return right away or not at all. And that's a really good one for a cert timeout preemptively. It's like if I've waited this long, just stop. It's not going to come back. Yes, sir. Uh, I haven't actually done any comparison with those. I just say this one's built in. So I don't know what mechanism they use under the hood other than managing their own threads, you know, to, to spawn a separate thread. But yeah, if you have to do actual async coding and tests, awaitility is really good. Uh, that's definitely the way to go. But, so awaitility, think of as more powerful, more sophisticated. This is just, hey, if you need to do something quick, you've got it right here. Okay, so there's a bunch of the new assertions that are very useful there. Uh, so that's just documenting them. All right, we saw that. Now, this one is also kind of new. I'm going to mention it to you, but then we're going to move on to something a bit more interesting. When I first learned about programming by contract, as they used to call it, with the, in the testing literature, you talked about uh, preconditions and postconditions for each method and class and variance. I'm seeing a lot of nods, you remember this stuff. But that was never built into Java proper. There were always programming by contract libraries available. None of them ever seemed to catch on. But now in JUnit, they have something similar. So the idea here is to say, uh, let's. Let's talk about what pre and post conditions are very briefly. A post condition on a method is a Boolean condition that is true only if the preconditions were true at the beginning. And the classic example is a stack, okay? So I have a stack and I push an item on the stack and then what's true in the post condition, what's true after that? Well, there's one more item on the stack, that sort of thing. But think about the pop method. What's true at the end? The post condition is there's one less value on the stack, and here it is. But that's only true if the precondition is there's at least one element on the stack when you start. See? Now, according to true programming by contract, if the preconditions are true and the post condition fails anyway, that's when you're supposed to get an exception. <laughs> but Java doesn't do that. Java uses exceptions for preconditions. What is a null pointer exception other than a precondition failure? That shouldn't have been null. We can't do anything, see? So now we have this thing called assumptions. And assumptions are for preconditions. Assume this is true. And if it's not true, skip the test. Don't fail it. Ignore it. And here's what it looks like. And this example was taken right out of the uh, documentation. So 
here I have a stack, believe it or not. Java's still got a stack class. It's been in there for, well, since 1.0. <laughs> it's been rewritten about four times. At any rate, here I'm going to get the size of the stack, and this is what an assume true looks like. Assume the size is greater than zero. If this is false, if this is true, go ahead and call pop and see that the size went down by one. But if this is false, then don't even run. So let me run this in my, I'll run all these tests. And you, you can kind of see it at the bottom there. The pop on an empty stack has a circle with a line through it, basically indicating that the assumption wasn't true and therefore this test was ignored. It was skipped. See, so this is purely for precondition checking. So this one was true, and this one I pushed an element on it, so now the precondition, uh, actually that one was false, this one's true. There's a combined mechanism. Uh, I also checked that, yeah, see, there's my, that's what we'd normally do in Java. If you call pop on an empty stack, you get an empty stack exception, which, you know. And then there's an assuming that that combines them, but I don't find that as intuitive. So at any rate, if you're interested, that's available. It's specifically to help precondition checks and avoiding running tests. Again, I use this when I do, when I test that the value of a RESTful web service. In the assume true, I check to see if the service is up. You know, I generally do like a head request. And if it comes back as, yeah, okay, because usually any service that supports a GET request will probably support a head request as well. And therefore, if the head request comes back with an okay, then I, that's the assumption I look for. And if it's true, then I go ahead and do my test. Otherwise, I skip it. So that's, that's a useful feature there. Okay. This is great because what they've done is add a bunch of conditional mechanisms that are trivially easy to use and yet are very powerful. So for one thing, there's an annotation called enabled on OS or disabled on OS. And you can put that on a class or even on a test method. And the idea is you specify as the argument to this an enum, an OS enum, and here was the list of enums, a list of OSs available last time I checked. Good old AIX. <laughs> been a while, uh, Mac, Linux, Windows, Solaris of all things, and then other. And you can say only run this test on Windows or only run this test on Macs and Linux or something, or disable if you want, either way. And it just you're just turning on a flag on and off. So if you have some tests that work on Macs but not yet on Windows, you can annotate them accordingly. Likewise, you could do the same thing for a particular Java version. So there's enabled on JRE and disabled on JRE, and there's an enum for those as well. So here's what that looks like. So here's the, the JRE enum. And we just went there today, so I should be on the latest version. So now they have all the way up to 21. So they keep adding them. To every time they release a new JUnit version, it's preparing for the next Java version as well. Notice it doesn't go below 8. You must have Java 8 to run this. Okay, so I don't even know what this other would mean. <laughs> I mean, they've got every one up to 21. So, say it again? Well, they still got 8, so I don't know, you know, but yeah, it's, maybe it's a gag, you know. <laughs> I'd love to know what another was in that case, though, yeah. And by the way, there was the, as long as we're looking at it, here was the OS enum as well. So I doubt that's changed. Oh, they got free BSD now and open BSD. So it looks like you can get a little bit more detailed if you're interested. Can you imagine having a test that only worked on free BSD and not open BSD? I, what are you doing? I don't know. But at any rate, it's available. Okay, then they also have ways of checking for environment variables or system properties, which is really nice because you could set a system property on your CI server, for example, and your test will check it automatically. So these are called enabled if or disabled if environment variable or system property. And system properties you could set on the command line with a dash capital D. But environment variables, that's specific to certain operating systems. And you could use both if you want. And the argument can actually be a regular expression. So here's the example that I have in the repository. Again, I got this from the, um, 
from the user manual, and I kept adding a couple more. So this one is only enabled on a Mac. This one runs on Linux, Solaris, and Windows. Notice how you put all three in curly braces like an array. This one only runs on Java 8. This runs on 8, 11, and 17. And then here's the one I didn't mention in the slides. Enabled for JRE range. And that's inclusive. Min and max is what you specify. So this runs on every JRE from 8 to 17 inclusive. If you leave out the min, it defaults to 8. If you leave out the max, it defaults to, uh, I think, the highest value in that enum list. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. So I tried it here, and uh, at the time, I, it, you know, I was just playing around with min and max. Now, here's the one with system property. Again, this is from their sample. You can look for a property called CI server and match, see if it matches the word true. Now, that's not a Boolean. That's a string. <laughs> Okay, so it's looking for the actual string there. But this is the other one they did, system properties, which you can get programmatically, os.arc, and this is a regular expression just looking for a 64 in it. So you only run this particular test on 64-bit operating systems, for example. Um, and then down here, environment variable called staging server or something. Then in JUnit 5.7, they put in a generic one. I don't mean generic in terms of types, a generalized one, just enabled if you specify the name of a method that takes no arguments and returns a Boolean. And then whatever that method returns, if it's true, you run. If it's false, you don't. So you even have a, a, a generalized way where you could put in your own conditions if you need to. And the best part is, this is these are one annotation things. I mean, they're, they're trivially easy to apply and can go either on the method or on the class. If they put on the class, it's the default for all the methods, which you can override on an individual method if you prefer. So those are all the conditional testing mechanisms that are built in now. Right. The method must be uh, must return a Boolean. If it's done at the class level, the Boolean method has to be static. Again, that makes sense. OK, now this is a mechanism people have been asking for for a long time. The idea of a tag is that you pick pretty much any arbitrary string that you want, and then in your build file, whether it's Maven or Gradle, you list which tags you're going to run tests for. So sometimes you have some test that is particularly slow, and you don't want to run in development mode. So you tag it with something like slow. And on the CI server, you can say include tags. Like here's, again, the sample from the docs. Include the fast tests and the ones that have both the tags smoke and feature A, for example. And all of those will run, or you could do exclude tags slow in CI, whatever it might be. Now, these strings are not completely arbitrary. You can't have any spaces in them. They can't start or end with a space. And there's certain special characters you can't use inside. But if you just stick with normal ASCII, you shouldn't have any issues. And all the restrictions are listed right in the, the user manual. Okay, So people wanted this for a long time, and it's, it's easy to do now. By the way, that's one of those repeated annotations. If you want to put tag, 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 that's OK. You don't need a wrapper one. Or you could put one tag on the class and others on the methods, and it kind of ands them together, saying this or that. It's, it's Actually, it's an or, really. Even though they used an and here, they meant uh, fast and tests that are smoke or feature A. Or maybe that's smoke and feature A. That may be an and. All right, never mind. Uh, we already talked about the life cycle one. You know, switching from per method to per class if you're interested in it. Uh, I mentioned that. Yeah, we already saw all that. Now, this, some people really like this. I'm still not sure why people get excited about it. Okay, I don't quite get it. But nested is a way of organizing your tests. If you have a test class with dozens of tests in it, you might want to group them together. And what it does is it allows you to make inner classes inside your test class, each of which is annotated with nested. And that will group them together and allow them to access the properties of the external class. So here's the example from the user manual. So this was nested tests. And you can see at the top here, we have a stack declared. 
and they say, okay, this is instantiated with new stack. See how that's what display name is for, make that easier to read. And now we have our first nested, so called when new. So there's a display name on a class. So it says before each, we'll actually instantiate the stack and assign it to the property. Remember, this is in the parent. This is up here, but we can do that. And then here we assert that it's empty and that it throws an empty stack exception if I call pop or peak. And then now this is a nested inside the nested, which just looks bizarre to me, <laughs> but it works. This is like after pushing an element, they push the element in the before each, and now it's no longer empty, and pop does return the element, and now the stack is empty, and here uh, peak returns the element, and it's not empty. And if you look at the test report, let me just do it inside IntelliJ, you can kind of see how the indents work. I mean, even if that's not obvious on the, on the output on the Gradle build report, you see how the indents come in? It's grouping the tests together. I guess if I could overcome my distaste for nested inner classes, then I'd probably use this more. But it's just a way to put related tests together. Like if you have a whole bunch of um, tests of a DAO layer, you know, and you want to put all the CRUD methods together or something, you might do that. Okay. I'm going to skip the constructor and method parameters. All I want to say about this, actually, one thing I'll say about it. In JUnit 4, you could not have arguments to the test methods or to the class, to the constructor. Okay? In JUnit 5, you can, but only if they implement something called parameter resolver, which is an interface. And there's some examples in the library, but again, they're not really strongly motivating. You know, they're not about that persuasive. However, I imagine some of you use the Spring framework. You know what implements Parameter Resolver in Spring? Auto-wired. In other words, you can auto-wire dependencies in the arguments to test methods. And therefore, the scope of that auto-wired parameter is just that test. You don't have to make it an attribute. And you could have different ones of the same type at different methods because they made AutoWire implement Parameter Resolver, and JUnit 5 is built into Spring, starting about 2.2, 2.3, something like that. So very useful there. So the examples I have in here, I'm not all that wild about. I'm just going to skip. But in Spring, it's really helpful. And I do have a Spring example in the JUnit repository. Now, repeated tests, as I say, I don't find all that helpful. But this is the good one, parameterized test. Now, the way this works is you use the annotation parameterize test and you must specify what they call a source. Where am I going to get the parameters for this method? And there's value source, which is, hey, I'm going to hard code some values right here. And that has to be either any of the primitive types or string or of all things class. I don't have a use case for that. But strings and primitives, sure. You have an enum source where you can list, yeah, test this for every value of that enum, and you could restrict it by regular expressions. They only include the ones that have this pattern or starting here, et cetera. A method source is the one I use the most. This is the one where you say, go look at the following method, and it's going to produce an iterable or an array, something that's, that Java knows how to iterate over. And it'll just grab all of those and run for every result that comes out of that. Uh, CSV source, comma, separated values, you hard code right in there. That I don't use very often, but CSV file source, you specify one or more files in the class path, and it will read the lines out of it and run tests for each line. Really useful. And then this argument source. So let me show you the example. So this is my parameterized test. So here, for example, this is a parameterized source whose name is the argument is prime and less than 20. Here is my value source, which in this, this case takes a, an array of ints. So these are the prime numbers less than 20. And now you see that the test takes an int as an argument. 
So each of these values is plugged in here and I check that they're prime and the result is as many tests as I had parameters. I mean, I see the individual results coming out of it and that's like something I wish I'd had years ago. Really helpful. I did the composite ones too. And as I say, the arguments to value source are all the primitive type, ints, booleans, bytes, chars, doubles, floats, long shorts, as well as classes and strings. So that's all there is to that. That one's easy, but then it requires you to know all the data up front. This is a method source. Now the rule for method source is that the method has to be, I have it right here, it has to have no arguments, it has to be a static factory method, and it produces something that Java knows how to iterate over, which means streams or arrays or iterables or even iterator. So here I'm just returning all the prime numbers less than 100, and here I'm executing the test on all of them, and you see they all come out right away. That's useful. Okay, I really like that a lot. In fact, every example I try to come up with about dynamic tests, I usually can just rewrite with this, and that's why I don't have a good sample for a dynamic test. I think they're the same speed. I don't think there's any performance difference. It's simply just, this is the collection of tests I want you to run and it just runs them. So uh, the, the interesting thing is, if you use JUnit 4's parallelization, I'm not, I mean, sorry, if you use JUnit 5's parallelization mechanism, which is setting a property in the, in the JUnit prop, parameters.properties file or whatever, I could show you that. These, all those tests of the prime numbers between two and 100 would come out all jumbled <laughs> because it would in fact run all those tests in parallel and there's no guarantee of ordering anymore. With Gradle, Gradle only runs test classes in parallel. So if I have like a dozen test classes, then I'll, I can run on all the different threads that I want. But if I have 10 tests in one test class, that's not parallelized. JUnit its parallel capabilities can make those parallel as well. The ones actually inside the test method. Because all it's doing is collecting all the tests ahead of time and then spawning as many threads as it needs. Say it again, please. Yeah. In fact, I can show you because I have it ready to go just in case somebody asked. Uh, down here under resources, I have a file called JUnit-platform.properties. This is where you specify properties for JUnit specifically, like saying, um, I'm always using per method for the life cycle or always using per class. But here, now again, this is experimental. But you see how I say parallel enabled is true and I want it to be running concurrently. And if I enable those and run the tests I just ran, you see how the numbers are coming out not in order anymore. And, but that's all one test class. Gradle would run the individual classes in parallel as well. I'm not sure how JUnit would interact with that, but it would be parallelized one way or another. Now again, that's still considered experimental, although I haven't seen any problems or changes with it in a long time. So I, I certainly would say it's fine to go ahead and use it. Okay, back to the parameterized tests. Let's get that out of the way. Um, here is a method source where you see I have three arguments this time. Instead of just doing a single value, I want to say the max of x and y is this value. That's what I want to write out. So I have a method here that needs to return something I could iterate over, but I want to put the triples together. That's what this arguments class is for. You say arguments.of, and then you could put your triples together or whatever, and they don't all have to be of the same type. They can be mixed types, and the types will be resolved as arguments in the test method. So this is going to say the max of 1 and 2 is 2, of 7 and 3 is 7, of 2 and 4 is 6, it'll just ignore the 8. If I uncommented that, I'd get an error, because it is expecting a third argument. And of 5 and 5 is 5, so just to illustrate that, it's a way to provide multiple arguments inside a test method. 
This one I find could be very useful for database data. Like you get a row of data out and instead of transforming it into an object, you could put in column one, column two, column three, whatever. Very nice there. Let me skip to, oh, uh, this is an enum source looking at the month enum from java.time. Just, I didn't have anything to check. I just said assert it's not null and that I have an array of months and I just say that it's in there. So the one they gave from the documentation said, let's look at chrono unit of all things. And we only want to match the ones that have any number of characters and then the word days and ends with that. So there's your regex. So this test itself matches half days and days for what it's worth. It always cracks me up that one of their hard-coded chrono units is half days. I, I don't have a use case for that either. Okay, this is a CSV source where the code, the, uh, the lines are hard coded in and the separator defaults to a comma, you put a space after it, it's ignored, but you could change the delimiter if you want. It could be anything you want. The default is a comma and this will take each of these rows and run it through here with, and notice it'll extract the title before the comma and a URL after it. And I'm using a URL validator from Apache Commons validator class. So I'm just using another library for this. And you see that it will run uh, all of them one by one, right, like that. Now here, uh, now let's skip that for the moment. Here is a CSV file source. I actually have a file in source main resources called bookdata.csv and it's just in columns. See? And notice I've got a header line here, okay? So in this CSV file source, I say where the file is and that's resources could be multiple ones. Num lines to skip, skip the first line and I put in the delimiter even though I didn't need to and it does all the same thing from before. Exactly, just running each book through there as well. Now, I've got a couple other things in there, but I'll stop at that for the moment. I do want to mention a couple other features. First of all, I have slides for each of those individual ones. The dynamic tests, again, I have them, but I'm not that great, wild about them. There's extensions available, so they don't have any run with. There's no JUnit runners anymore. It's an extend with, and the spring extension is built right into the spring test context. So when you say Spring Boot Test, it's got extends with Spring Extension right in it. In the next talk, I'm going to show the Makito extension as well. Say it again. I still didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Could so oh. Did you say JSON source? Um, they say there's an element in there. I have not seen it run. I don't know if it's maintained. I don't, it's not maintained by Spring. On the wiki page, that's what this is from, the wiki page at the, at the uh, GitHub repository, that's a, a list of known extensions, but I don't know how often they update that. So Spring comes with JSON you know, a JSON test engine, and it works with them. I'm not sure how they make it work. Okay, they may use an extension for that as well. But yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't hear what you were saying. Okay, uh, we didn't have time to talk about Assert J. The only thing I'll tell you about Assert J is they've got, a, it's a beautiful library with all kinds of power to it. And you can, there's the, again, the links and everything that I'll give you. And I like the database ones as well. And I think I have one example which I can, I can show you very quickly and then I'll stop. So here is, like you say, assert that and you put in the argument is not null, starts with, contains, ends with, or assert that last name is equal to ignoring case or is after or before. This thing is huge, the size of the library. And I've even got exception handling in here, like assert that exception of type is thrown by with message. And you could even find out, you know, transitive mes messages and everything. I do recommend it. It's very simple. Again, it comes with spring. You know, when you make a spring boot test, it's in there. So a lot of the spring docs use it. 
I really like it. I'm still learning. It's, we just don't have time to get into it in any more detail, okay? That's everything I brought with me. That's everything new that I did. So thank you very much for coming. <laughs>